course, that's something we call it the lecture this evening. Um, you have the benefit of hearing three wonderful lectures, and you're not going to be tested on any misinformation. Uh, I thought I said an exam. <laughs> so, so you can sit back and enjoy. Um, I practiced this with my class on Friday, and it took me an hour and 45 minutes to get through not all of the slides. <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm trying to figure out how I can do this uh, for you all in a period of 20 minutes. So I'm going to get through as much as I can. What I would like to do this evening is introduce you to the world of human trafficking and tell you what you think you know is probably not what the reality tells us. Um, and I'm doing this through a series of slides that will introduce you first to a myth and then to the reality of human trafficking. that is probably the most commonly used definition in human trafficking. It's the definition that is put forth in the UN protocol, the trafficking protocol, which supplements the United Nations Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. It was introduced for signing in 2000. It was uh, ratified and it went into effect in December, December 25th, 2003. Um, and it is, hang on a second, it is currently, uh, it's been ratified by 158 countries. So this protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking persons, especially women and children, has three constituent elements. These elements are the act, so this is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons. The second element is the means used to traffic people. And these means are threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, fraud, or deception, or the abuse of power or a position of vulnerability, or the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person, meaning in layman's terms, buying a child from the parents. Okay, and the third element is for the purpose of exploitation. And you'll notice that it doesn't say that the exploitation has to occur, but you can be charged with trafficking if you recruit, transfer, 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 harbor, or receive persons using any of these means for the purpose of exploiting them. Okay? Exploitation shall include at a minimum the exploitation of the prostitution of others or other forms of sexual exploitation, so as using individuals in pornography. Uh, forced labor or services, slavery or practices similar to slavery, servitude, or the removal of organs. It is not about trafficking the organs themselves, but about trafficking the people for the purpose of harvesting their organs. Okay? Um, one of the things that the UN uh, protocol makes perfectly clear is that in the case of children, so when we're talking about individuals under the age of 18, the means don't have to be present. So you don't have to treat them or coerce them or use fraud or anything like that. If you try to recruit a child by telling the child, you know, I'll give you a bicycle and you come work for me for three years in, in, you know, in a rock quarry and the child willingly goes along with you, that is still human trafficking. Not for an adult, you have to coerce them or use fraud or trickery, but in the case of children, you don't have to have the means present. Okay, uh, first myth, human trafficking is an event. And what do I mean by event? Well, burglary is an event. Homicide is an event. Um, where any type of car theft is an event. We can generally pinpoint these crimes down to the place, the time, and the date, approximately. But when we're talking about human trafficking, we're not talking about an event, we are talking about a process, okay? And I know that you can't see that that well, so I'll go through a bit of things. But if you look at this, and this is sort of a model of international uh, human trafficking. It starts out with the recruitment of an individual, then you have to transfer that individual and bring that, in the case of international trafficking, bring that person into another country. The person is then exploited, although it could occur during the transportation phase. The victim may be disposed of, and I'll go through each one of these in a little bit more detail. And I added the criminal process here because when I talk to people in law enforcement, I tell them anytime you're doing a financial investigation, 
and you come upon cases of money laundering, you should be asking yourself, where does this money come from? Okay, is it illegal gambling? Is it illegal drugs? Is it prostitution? Is it human trafficking? So the investigation into money laundering should lead us back to where is this money coming from? What I've done for also, in addition to giving you all these different phases of the human trafficking process, is identify different crimes that occur either against the individual victim or against the state in each one of these phases. So for instance, when a person's being recruited, okay, we can either recruit them through false promises or we can kidnap them, we can use force. Um, I will tell you, in the, I've been working uh, in the area of human trafficking since 2000. Um, I was at, I was in Sicily when the uh, Palermo Protocol was open, the trafficking protocol was open for signature. Um, in all the years, the 13 years that I've been working on cases of human trafficking and talking to police officers and talking to immigration officials, and reading, you know, news articles and looking at police case files, I have not come across a single case of abduction. Okay? So, but it can happen. So, we've got kidnapping or fraudulent promises and then possibly document forgery. That's a crime against the state. As we move along this way, okay, the transportation and entry phase, the first project that I worked on for the UN was a project looking at Filipinos that were exploited in Australia and Japan. Um, those women that were taken to these countries were flown by air, put up in four or five star hotels, and they weren't exploited until they got to their destination. But that's not true. If you look at other cases of human trafficking, when people are brought overland and smuggled into Europe, many of these individuals are exploited along the way. So this exploitation actually takes place here, and that can involve assault, false imprisonment, locking somebody up, rape, forced prostitution, um, and then, of course, we, crimes against the state or corruption of government officials, document forgery, abuse of immigration laws. This is where the brunt of the uh, harm against the victims occurs in the exploitation phase, and some of these same uh, crimes will be perpetrated against the victims to include theft of documents, rape, uh, attempted murder, and murder. Okay? Um, here, when victims are disposed of, what we see in that case is, for instance, uh, children that are used in begging, and they are too old, so they may either be disposed of or they may be used in other forms of um, human trafficking as well, too. Victims can be abandoned or they can also be murdered. Um, okay, so this process, I don't, and, and, and one other thing about this process, too, you know, when we think about a car theft, you go to sleep at night, your car's missing in the morning, you call the police, you say it was parked in front of my house, this is the address, and it was stolen sometime between midnight and six o'clock in the morning. Well, in the case of human trafficking, between this and this or this, we're talking about weeks, months, and sometimes even years. It was a case in the United States of a, a domestic servant held for 19 years before she was um, discovered and free. So this process can take place in a number of different countries and over an extremely long period of time. Um, number two, trafficking, human trafficking involves crossing international borders. This is what we always think of, because we always think of Russian and Ukrainian and Romanian and Bulgarian women forced into prostitution in the Netherlands. And if we look at the statistics, we do see that pattern. But what is really sort of underscored and, and Human trafficking also occurs within our own borders. Uh, the National Rapporteur on Human Trafficking here in the Netherlands is very, very good. We've identified that pattern, and I'm sure that all of you that sort of follow the news have heard of this lover boy phenomena, where, where young Dutch girls are sort of grooved and then introduced and forced into prostitution. This is a phenomena that's not recognized in all countries. Um, and two or three years ago, the UK government police officers called me and said, we want to know more about this. And I said, you should actually probably be talking to the National Laboratory in the Netherlands. But they started to uncover that same pattern there. Um, so what kind of patterns do we see when we talk about the reality of human trafficking? Um, internal trafficking happens, domestic trafficking, and it's greatly undetected in many countries. A couple of years ago, I was talking to a high-ranking law enforcement official who said to me, we don't, have, we don't have domestic trafficking in my country. I'm surprised that it happens in 
the UK and in Belgium and in the Netherlands and Germany and Italy. And I said, why do you think that you don't have a problem in your country? And she said, because our families are very close knit and women don't go into prostitution in this country. And that sends a message to me that there are a lot of women forced into prostitution in our country and nobody's even looking for them. So, um, to intro particularly when borders are porous. So we see people being moved, let's say, within Central Europe, or within Southeast Asia, or within Central Asia. It's much more difficult to start bringing people into the UK from China than it is to start bringing North Koreans into China. Um, and then, of course, you have, uh, and this is a pattern that we see very frequently, child trafficking throughout West Africa. The borders are very, very porous. And um, it's not national allegiance, but it's tribal allegiance. So if you speak the same language, it doesn't matter what side of the border you live on, people will start turning your shoulder. Uh, and trans-regional or inter-regional trafficking patterns, this is what we're probably most familiar with when we look at these large-scale trafficking patterns and, um, and uh, international women being forced into prostitution. Um, which brings? bigger than that. Here in Europe, we spend a lot of energy uncovering human trafficking and forced prostitution, but if you look in other parts of the world, other forms of prostitution, excuse me, of human trafficking are much, much more prevalent. Okay? This can be divided into traditional forms of human trafficking and non-traditional forms. Okay? The traditional forms of human trafficking can take place in the legitimate economy, so we're talking about in fishing, in the construction industry, on farms, we have had uh, cases here in the Netherlands of uh, Dutch farmers, a woman who was exploiting, I want to say, Polish and Romanian workers on her asparagus farm, okay? Um, so you can, have, you can exploit people in a legitimate market, okay? Restaurants, hotels, factories, farms, construction, fishing, brick kilns, and even the fashion industry, okay? The domestic service industry is also a legitimate industry, and this thing is really Areas where um, where it's really very very difficult to get a feel for uh, whether exploitation is occurring because remember when when women are forced into prostitution there's always the likelihood that they are going to come into contact with a customer and they say something to the customer and the customer to, to the customer calls the police or calls a hotline calls Melvinistat I mean here in the Netherlands and in the UK they call Crime Stoppers and then it's reported and that this woman is rescued. But when people work as domestic servants in homes and they have no access to contact outside of that home, the likelihood that they're going to be identified is much, much, much smaller. In addition to the fact that they may be exploited as domestic servants, many of these women, and I'm talking specifically about the Middle East, many of these women are also raped by men in the household. So they're exposed to really, really dangerous situations um, that go even beyond the exploitation of the labor uh, as household and domestic service. If you want to know what's going on in terms of human trafficking and exploitation in the legitimate labor sector, type into Google Middle East, Qatar, and Nepali workers. Okay? And you can read horrible stories of how these foreign workers are exploited uh, really to the point that they're dying. They go into massage parlors. They go into places that could serve as a front for prostitution slash forced prostitution. But what we're starting to uncover now are other forms of human trafficking. Uh, one of them is organ trafficking. This is also mentioned in the um, UN protocol. Child soldiers in uh, African countries. Uh, forced marriage as a form of human trafficking of all Thank you. 
crunchy as you know, how, what do we have in terms of uh, in terms of the number of, of, of victims, in terms of how many victims are provided assistance, in terms of, of traffic versus convictions, etc. And um, we were asking countries to identify uh, new trends of trafficking and uh, the use of handicapped individuals, mentally and physically for forced begging is starting to crop up in a number of countries. Um, the UK uncovered a huge, huge, huge trafficking ring involving Roma children. Uh, there was a 600% increase in pickpocketing and thefts in London, and um, the police sat down and said, hmm, isn't this odd? A lot of these kids that were arresting, a lot of these individuals that were arrested for these crimes are Roma children. They're under the age of 18, and they didn't just decide to pick up and leave Romania and come over to the UK by themselves. Somebody is bringing these kids into the country and forcing them into forced begging and pickpocketing. And they uncovered this international trafficking ring um, in, in UK and Spain. Uh, UK is also starting to uncover social security fraud where people are brought into the country and forced to apply for social security and then the money's taken away from them. Okay, uh, traffickers promise a number of, number of traffickers promise unsuspecting women jobs in foreign countries as governments, nannies, chambermaids, cooks, and then force them into prostitution. That's not quite the reality. Um, I focus on victim continuum. I do this a lot in my criminology classes. For those of you who are taking criminology with me, you know that I promise everything on a continuum. And it starts with complete coercion. This would be, let's say, um, how we view victims. Because we would like to think that victims are, are perfect victims, right? They're pure, they're innocent of everything, and we'd like to shower them with all the help and assistance that we can give them. Okay? We would agree that if somebody was brought into trafficking as a result of complete coercion, if they were kidnapped and forced into trafficking, we would all agree that they're victims of trafficking, correct? But as we move along this victim continuum, we see total deception where individuals will to leave their countries, they're told they're gonna to work as seamstresses, they're told they're gonna to work as maids, and then they're tricked and they're forced into prostitution. Okay, this happens. Now, we get a little bit more to this part of the continuum and we see partial deception. And what that means is that uh, individuals are told, you know what, you're gonna go dance in a club. You might have to, it's a strip, it's a strip club. And you have to take your clothes off, and men will shove dollar bills into your G-string, but that's as far as it goes. You don't have to have sex with them. So they know that it's not quite kosher, it's not quite legitimate, but they're told they don't have to have intercourse, so they agree to do it. They arrive at their destination, and they're forced into prostitution. But guess what? Now we're starting to uncover other types of cases. And these cases are cases in which women are actually recruited working as prostitutes in their home country, and um, they're told, you know what? If you're making 10 euros an hour, the equivalent of 10 euros an hour working as a prostitute in Romania, we can get you 50 euros an hour working in the Netherlands. But you have to give 30 of it to me. I'm your trafficker. And you say to yourself, do the math. Why would I work for myself for 10 euros an hour in Romania if I could work for 20 euros an hour in the Netherlands, right? So you agree to go. But what does the UN, what does the UN trafficking protocol say about these people? They're still victims of trafficking. Even though they knew about the kind of work that they were doing, they were deceived about the, the um, conditions of the work. Not the type of work, but the conditions. And what I mean by that is that the trafficker doesn't tell them you're going to have to work six to seven days a week. You have to make a minimum of 1,000 euros a night and you don't stop having sex with customers until you bring 1,000 euros into me. Um, if you're sick, you still have to work. If you have a period, you still have to work. Um, and if you're pregnant, well, you have an abortion. There's no discussion about it. Oh, and by the way, I will tattoo my initials on your arm so that everybody knows you're mine. They would never agree to do what they're doing under those conditions. So there's always some form of deception Deception involved in the trafficking process. But of course, we would be very, very willing to provide services and assistance to that first group and the second group. The minute we start moving a little bit further along the continuum where we're talking about women that were already working in prostitution.
institution, it becomes much more difficult for law enforcement to view these individuals as victims of trafficking. We still, in many countries, see them as prostitutes and as illegal migrants, and we ship them back home. We detain them and ship them back home before we provide them with protection that the UN protocol calls for. Okay, I forgot to put this myth up here, although I have the answer here. The most common myth is between the trafficking or adult women exploited in prostitution. Well, you know what I tell my students about crimes like this? You only find what you look for. And if you only look for women working in prostitution, you will find them. About two years ago, I was at a conference, and uh, one of the NGOs said, you know, the police were telling us that um, the kidnapping, of course, were mainly men working in prostitution here in this country, in the Netherlands. And they were servicing the male homosexual community. No problem, right? Nobody thought they were trafficked, because the police just assumed that they were freelance sex workers, and there's no problem if they want to come over here and work as sex workers. The problem is they were trafficked. They were victims of human trafficking. Um, we find what we look for. And because we're so good at looking for women forced into prostitution, because we know we have to look in brothels, we know we have to look in massage parlors, we know we have to look in these nail parlors, these places that sort of service traditional fronts for prostitution, we can uncover it much more easily. But let me show you some statistics, because this is kind of interesting. These are from the uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. They have a Oh my goodness, okay. Um, you can see that. I'll try. Russia is woman. The, the majority of individuals identified worldwide were women, but this varies by region. Okay? If you look here at Central and Eastern, uh, excuse me, Europe and Central Asia, 84% of the victims are adults. But if you look, for instance, at Africa and the Middle East, 68% are children. The one thing that I also tell my students is that trafficking patterns will vary tremendously from one country to the next, okay? Not just the markets, but also the, um, the, I'm going to skip some of these. I'm going to give you, okay, I'm going to give you a couple of little lessons. Okay. Statistics. I always tell my students, the one thing that you need to walk out of the class and know is that statistics can be manipulated just any way that you want them. The ILO, and the ILO is recognized by the International Labor Organization. This is one of the most legitimate <laughs> estimates worldwide of the number of people enslaved by, through human trafficking, okay? If you look at any form of forced labor, they estimate 12 million. Let's say that there's 2.45 million people worldwide. Look at the number of victims that were identified. It's pretty shocking. 46,000 victims identified in 2012 worldwide where we're estimating 2.45 million people. This means either our estimates are completely completely off, but we're simply not good enough at covering victims of human trafficking. And can I do one more? This <laughs> is my last slide, okay? <laughs> and then I want to show you one thing, and then we should <laughs> are women because they're more trustworthy, because they're high school friends, etc., etc. Um, and this is very, very interesting because this is a distribution of males and females according to region. If you look at Africa and the Middle East, you've got 83% are males, 73% are females. And if you look at this in East Europe and Central Asia, 38% of the traffickers are males and 62% are females. Um, this means, and I will tell you, if you study human trafficking patterns, you'll see that they're constantly changing because criminals are extremely intelligent, criminal organizations are learning organizations, and they are constantly changing their modus operandi to reflect <coughs> changes that law enforcement have made to catch them. Okay, I just have one more thing to say, and that's for all of my students that are taking criminology, the two of you sitting there. I have now found a way to 
introduce Absalom Caspi, Terry Moffat, or um, Travis Hershey's social bond theory into this lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>
work in the Constitution, so women won't talk about that. And um, these traffickers very often have recruited them know where these women, where they live, in their home countries, they know where the children of the are, they know where the parents are, mm -hmm. and all you have to do is threaten these victims to kill the child of parents or grandparent, and the women will not talk, the victims will not talk. Um, so the likelihood that they're going to cooperate is, is slim. My question was, um, what role does technology play in human trafficking? sexual activities on the camera and then uh, on, the, on the internet and then uh, blackmailing them with it. Uh, the internet can be used to uh, set up um, uh, dating services, um, organizing sex tours so that individuals can go travel to countries and then uh, sexually abuse children. The internet has been known for that and also for uh, their travel agencies that cater to pedophiles who travel abroad as child sex tourists and then abuse these children. Um, the internet has been clearly used to spread child pornography, and child pornography in and of itself is not trafficking, but if children are being sexually abused, whether it's trafficking or not, it's a really severe crime. Um, on the other hand, technology has been used to fight human trafficking, okay? Maybe that was what you were, you were interested in looking at. Um, and we have talked about this a little bit before the, the presentations. Um, credit card companies are working very, very closely with this International Center for Exploited and Missing Children to block credit cards for companies that sell dubious material, you know? So um, that has been used to, uh, to study. If, if they can't pay, then they can't order these child por you know, por pornographic pictures and things like that. Um, and of course, police are constantly using the internet to look for advertisements that people place. And the minute they place advertisements for young girls, particularly young girls, things like that, that lead the police to believe that you know, they're Surveying children, they're using children sexually, uh, the police do these sting operations and try to bring them down. There's one more thing that I know the, the NFI are working on at the moment, the, the Dutch Forensics Institute, and that's where they're looking at the type of language that is used in grooming on internet, the type of stuff you were uh, describing, where they um, recruit young girls and pledge up to do stuff on the internet. They look at the language usage and they uh, statistically try to model it such that they can take features out and when they know what the features are of tricky conversations on the internet, they actually then can identify them and they run pattern recognizers on them to, so they're, they're working on that at, 